we have a quorum now and I'll get started and um, I doubt that I'll get my hour and a half lecture completed in the 45 minutes before lunch so maybe what I'll do is go till there's a good stopping spot and then like we did with Mary Jane the other day I think it was Mary Jane we'll maybe come back and finish up the last bit of the lecture before we do the labs but we'll just see how it goes so anyway what I want to talk about today is the volume scattering function in a little more detail to give you a feeling for what these things actually look like and then also talk about models that people have developed for scattering and backscattering and uh, volume scattering functions uh, over the years and most of those models have been built into hydrolyte for example so you need to know what they look like before you start clicking buttons in hydrolyte. So to go back to this uh, you know uh, organizational chart of uh, all the things used in optical oceanography uh, Colin talked in detail yesterday about the absorption coefficient and so today I'm going to talk about the volume scattering function and the things that you can derive from that the total scattering coefficient backscattering scattering phase function and so forth and then we will have pretty well filled in this box on inherent optical properties which is our topic for the week so the things to think about on IOPs uh, first of all you know they depend on the concentration and for scattering the size distribution and the composition of the particles and you know so on so um, in other words they, de they depend on the material properties the physical properties of the material they do not depend on the light field in the water so therefore you can take a sample of water take it in the laboratory and measure IOPs in the laboratory when we get to apparent optical properties AOPs next week you can't measure those in the laboratory you have to measure them in situ in the ocean so IOPs are nice in that you can do it in the laboratory rather than hanging over the side of a ship. The other thing to remember about IOPs is that there are two fundamental ones. The absorption coefficient, which will be a function of depth and wavelength, and the volume scattering function. And if you have those two, any of the other things you might want to know about, total scattering, backscattering, beam attenuation, all of those things, are derivable from these two so the things you'd really like to have in the real world are the absorption coefficient and the volume scattering function and absorption you can get out of your AC9 or your spectrophotometer the volume scattering function is a little bit harder to get to okay so the volume scattering function how it's defined to sort of repeat some of what Colin said this morning is we're going to have a volume of water here so I don't show this face out here but we have some little volume of water it's of thickness delta R so in an instrument that might be a centimeter it might be 10 centimeters but some thickness of water we're going to put radiant power so so many watts of power coming into this volume of water hitting this face of our little cube if that's what it is and some of that energy goes straight through it's transmitted nothing happens to it some of it will be absorbed inside the volume of water and some of it will be scattered off in various directions so there's some amount of power phi sub s scattered at some scattering angle phi here and that's scattered into some little solid angle delta omega okay so that's our basic conceptual geometry and we're going to assume that this delta R, the distance it's going through the water, is small enough that we only have single scattering inside our volume. That is, the light will just be scattered once. It doesn't bounce around in here and then finally go off in that direction. So the VSF is going to, de the volume scattering function, is going to describe to us how light is scattered directionally in any one scattering event. When you have multiple scattering, you can just think of that as a series of single scatterings, and each of those single scatterings will be described by the volume scattering function. Okay, so how do we define this magic thing, uh, usually called beta? It's a function of the scattering angle psi and then, of course, of wavelength. 
Well, the idea is let's take the scattered power here. We can measure that. And so we'll take that. We can measure how much power is going in. So we'll normalize the scattered by the incident power. And then we're going to divide by the distance the light goes through here, delta r. And we're going to divide by however much the little bit of solid angle is. So it's scattered power per incident irradiance per some distance per some solid angle. So, you know, whatever the units are here, whether it's watts or maybe you're measuring things in volts or something, it doesn't matter. The units there cancel out and you're left with the volume scattering function having units of per meter per steradian. So it's a measure of how much light is scattered per meter that the light travels and per steradian of the solid angle you're looking at. And conceptually, you would define this as saying, well, now here's our geometry. Now let's take the limit as the, the, di the distance here goes to zero and the solid angle goes to zero. <coughs> so that's the conceptual definition. But of course, in a real instrument, you don't have delta r's going to zero. You always have some finite uh, distance there. Now, another way to think of this is, you remember the other day I defined the intensity, which is power scattered per unit solid angle. So here we have uh, the power scattered per unit solid angle. So phi s over delta phi is the scattered intensity. And then if we take the, the we have a, a face over here of some delta A, let's call it, and I have power is hitting the face here on this side. So the power per unit area is irradiance. And so if I go in here and I write a delta area here times a delta area, then this power per unit area is irradiance. And then the delta area times the delta distance is the volume. So I can also think of the volume scattering function as being intensity scattered per unit incident irradiance onto my volume per, or, or per unit volume. So that's why it's called the volume scattering function, as opposed to here you might call it the distance scattering function or something. But this is where the origin of volume scattering function comes out. And uh, the bottom line is if you know the volume scattering function, you know everything there is to know about how the medium scatters light if we ignore polarization. And if we include polarization, we actually have to have not one number, but a four by four matrix of numbers called the Mueller matrix. So Ken Boss will get into that next week. Okay, so that's our definition. And as I said, if we know that, we know we can figure out everything else. So if we wanna know the total scattering coefficient, that's how much light is scattered into all directions, not just the one direction. Well, we would simply integrate the volume scattering function over direction, so over steradians or unit, unit uh, uh, solid angle here, over all four pi steradians, and that's by definition our scattering coefficient. If we really wanted to compute this, we remember the element of solid angle, is sine theta or sine psi d psi d phi and if this is azimuthally symmetric we're going to integrate phi from zero to two pi and so that's where the two pi comes from and then we do this integral here with whatever this function looks like as a function of scattering angle psi okay uh, all right so Anyway, that's how much light is scattered without regard for what direction it's scattered into. Now, there's this thing called the scattering phase function, which we say, look, the volume scattering function has both a magnitude and it has some shape. Well, if we can sort of separate that into two pieces, one that describes the magnitude and one that describes the shape of the scattering, that's what we're getting here the shape part or the angular dependence is called the scattering phase function, and that's the volume scattering function 
divided by the strength of the scattering or the scattering coefficient. The idea here is we're looking at how much light is scattered into all directions. So if this is very clear water, may not scatter much light, you'll have a small scattering function or a small uh, total scattering function. If it's very turbid, it scatters a lot, you'll get a big scattering function. So B is carrying the magnitude of how strong or how strongly the medium scatters light. And then if we take the total that has both magnitude and directional information, divide by the magnitude part, we'll get a part that describes the angular part. So we're splitting the total into a magnitude or strength of scattering times a function that gives us the angular dependence called the phase function. Now, it's a historical name. The phase function has nothing to do with the phase of light. It's because the geometry is similar to here comes light and it scatters off and it goes up here and I measure this angle. That's kind of like uh, I have the earth here and the sun is over here and the moon is up here and this angle determines the phase of the moon as I see it from the earth. So the astronomers called this the phase angle because it was related to the phase of the moon as you see it from the earth and that varies with the day of the month. And the name carried over into scattering here <coughs> because the geometry is the same but it has this phase has not phase scattering angle has nothing to do with the phase of the moon nor does it have anything to do with the phase of an electromagnetic wave. So it's kind of historical and bad notation. Uh, the backscatter coefficient, as Colin mentioned, if we just look at light that is scattered by more than 90 degrees, and that's always relative to the direction of the incident light. So if the light starts out in this direction, then I'm scattering from 90 to 180 here. So that's what we call the backscatter coefficient. We're going to integrate this guy over 90 degrees to 180, or in radians, pi over 2 to pi. So that's the definition of that. But if we know the volume scattering function, we can compute that. And then there's the backscatter fraction, which is of the total scattering, what's the fraction that is backscattered? Well, that's just b sub b over b and talk about bad notation here the b means scattering and this b means backwards so you've got the same letter in the same symbol meaning two different things but i didn't invent the notation so b sub b is actually backward scattering or backscatter and then the backscatter fraction is the fraction that is backscattered relative to the grand total and Colin mentioned the other day, there's something called the albedo of single scattering, which is the total scattering over the total attenuation. And that's a useful quantity in things like Monte Carlo simulations. You can see if there's no scattering, omega naught would be equal to zero. And if it's, there's no absorption, then omega naught is equal to one. So omega naught is actually in any given, inf given interaction, the probability that the photon will be scattered versus absorbed. So uh, omega naught equals one. There's no absorption. It's always scattered. If omega naught's equal to zero, there's no scattering. It's always absorbed and anything in between. So, uh, all right. So I'm not going to talk about the instrument designs for how to measure the volume scattering function. There have been a number of them built over the years going all the way back to actually like the 1930s or so. Um, but it's a whole lecture to talk about how do you actually design an instrument to measure the volume scattering function. It's actually uh, you know, a more complicated business than say an instrument to measure absorption like a spectrophotometer. The geometry is a lot more complicated. You have to have light going in and you have to have some kind of way to look at all the different directions coming around and so forth. And uh, Ken would be a better person to give that lecture anyway since he actually understands instruments. But So I'm not going to talk about the designs of the instruments, but I will show you uh, example measurements from instruments. And so here's uh, to get started on how variable volume scattering functions can be and what they look like as a function of the scattering angle, 
Uh, there's this fellow, Ted Petzold, going way back into the 60s, built a couple of instruments that measured, one of them measured the very small angle scattering, and one measured from about 10 to 170 degrees, and so he used those two instruments and pieced the two pieces together and came up with a very widely used and widely quoted uh, set of volume scattering functions that usually just gets called Petzold's data or Petzold's volume scattering function. So uh, here's three of them. Uh, he went into San Diego Harbor, which is very turbid water with no telling what kind of sediments and stuff resuspended in it. So there's the red curve. He went into the coastal ocean off the coast of California, and he went into very clear water in the Bahamas and he made these measurements. So here's our volume scattering function per meter per steradian versus scattering angle on a log-log plot. And if you look here, there's about two orders of magnitude uh, difference in the very clear water and the very turbid water. And then here's the scattering coefficients, 0 0.037 up to 1.8, so a factor of whatever that is, 30 or so in the scattering coefficient, a couple orders of magnitude in the difference in, in the actual curves themselves. If you plot the same thing on a uh, log linear scale, you get something like this. So there's his three curves there. And uh, <coughs> people sort of think that Petzold's data is some kind of law of physics and it's widely applicable, it's not. It's, he, he actually had about five sets of data or six, and they're just what he happened to measure on that day. And if you went back to San Diego Harbor now, who knows what you would measure today. So keep in mind, these are just three data sets, and the reason it got to be so widely used and widely quoted is that for a few decades, they were the only data available because he had the only instruments that could measure this. So uh, it got to be very widely used, although it's now sort of dropping out of use because there are, are new data and better ways to do things. But uh, anyway, so <clears throat> here's the idea now. If you look at, at these Petzold curves, they differ a lot in magnitude but they have roughly the same shape as a function of scattering angle. So going back to this idea of can we split the VSF into a magnitude part and a shape part, well, if we just take each of these curves and divide by a scattering coefficient, so we'll divide this one by 1.82, uh, this one by 0.4, and this one by 0.037, do those curves then lie on top of each other? And the answer is, yeah, they do pretty well. Uh, you know, there's some differences up here at small angles. There's actually pretty large differences here in the backscatter region. But in general, they're kind of the same shape. So we have this idea that we'll take the volume scattering function, which is highly variable in magnitude, divide by the scattering coefficient, which is highly variable. And with luck, maybe the phase function is then not very variable. So can we get away with using one phase function for the ocean and all we have to do is change the scattering coefficient? That would be uh, nice if that assumption is good, but how good is it? Well, actually not very good. Uh, the green curves here are a bunch of data uh, made by an instrument called the volume scattering meter, which was developed by uh, some Ukrainians, a guy named Michael Lee. And then Marlon Lewis at Dalhousie took this on a cruise, and Emmanuel was on the cruise, and I ended up with some of the data. So here, just in waters off of coastal New Jersey, at one wavelength, these green curves here show the variability in the phase function. And notice, once again, log scale. If we go to the backscatter direction here, there's an order of magnitude variability in these phase functions, although Petzold is really good on average. So if you don't have any information about what the phase function is in the Damariscotta River, and you assume it's Petzold's phase function, you may luck out. Or you may be off by a factor of five too big or a factor of five too small. 
So you keep that in mind when you're running hydrolyte and you didn't measure the phase function and you have to pick one. Well, you could pick well and it's just beginner's luck or you could be tremendously off on your phase function in which case all the rest of your calculations are going to be tremendously off. So this idea of having a, a single phase function, well, Petzl might work pretty well on average, but there really is a lot of variability in the real world, so you cannot get away with some one generic phase function for the oceans. And you notice also in these measurements, they all kind of have some really weird little bumps back here and do weird things. Well, that's probably some instrument artifact, who knows. Um, okay, so uh, I think I just said this, that when you're running hydrolyte, you may have measurements of absorption and scattering from an AC9 or an ACS, but you'll almost never have measurements of the volume scattering function. Yeah, Kale. Yeah, there is wavelength dependence. Um, certainly some, but this instrument only worked at one wavelength, 530. So, you know, I don't have an instrument that I can show you 400, 530, 600, whatever, but there certainly will be dependence there. I just can't say. Yeah. Okay, so um, when you go to run hydrolyte or, or do something else, you often end up guessing what phase function to use. And if you guess right, you know, life is good. If not, your hydrolyte results are going to be way off because something like remote sensing reflectance is proportional to how much light got in the water and got back scattered out. If you increase the backscattering by a factor of five, you increase the remote sensing reflectance by a factor of five. So you'll learn that story next week when you run hydrolyte, guess the phase function, it doesn't agree, its output does not agree with what you measured for remote sensing reflectance, let's say, and the answer is almost always because you guessed the wrong phase function. Um, okay, so, uh, Something else to keep in mind here is that in your uh, AC9, for example, when you're measuring absorption, you had to correct for scattering, otherwise you get the wrong absorption. It's the same thing if you have an instrument that's measuring the phase function or, or the volume scattering function, you have losses to absorption along the way between your volume and your detector. So you have to correct the AC9 for scattering. You have to correct your volume scattering meter for absorption. And in the ocean, you can never, you almost never ignore absorption or ignore scattering. You have to measure them both. And they're interrelated. I need to know the scattering to get the absorption in the AC9. And I need to know the absorption to get the scattering uh, phase function in some other instrument and you know you have to do some iterative thing I mean who knows what it's a really complicated business but just keep that in mind that uh, you really have to measure both absorption and scattering simultaneously and well that's hard to do because you need to know one to correct the other so it's a real can of worms all right Colin I think has made the point that scattering depends strongly on the particle size distribution. Here's a good example. This plane, the guy is doing 1,200 kilometers an hour, 25 meters above the sea surface, so he's probably dead by now, but anyway, he got away with it once, and this was photographed off the side of an aircraft carrier as the plane went by at the, basically the speed of sound. Um, there's a shock wave coming off the nose of the airplane that goes back like this. So out here, if we take a cubic meter of air, there's a certain amount of water in that cubic meter of air, but it's there as water molecules. Then when this cubic meter of air crosses this shock wave, there's a big drop in pressure. So all of a sudden the pressure drops, the water droplets condense out and make fog particles. So now right here, you have the same amount of water in a cubic meter but now you have a few large water droplets as opposed to a lot of small uh, water molecules. And 
the scattering by the water molecules is very weak. The scattering by the water droplets is very strong. So all of a sudden you see this cloud and then as you go, the air goes past here, the pressure then rises back up to the ambient pressure, the water droplets evaporate and you're back to what you started with. So it's just a nice picture of how something like changing just the particle size distribution, in this case from molecules to little fog droplets, tremendously changes scattering. And the same thing will happen if you change the shape of the particles or their index refraction or whatever. Okay, so let's start talking at least, get, get going on how people model uh, scattering and volume scattering functions for various things, water, phytoplankton. CDOM, uh, well that's the good one because we almost always assume that CDOM has negligible scattering. And then there are non-algal particles, but there's detritus, maybe from living phytoplankton that have died. There's uh, colored particulate inorganic matter, which is usually mineral particles. It could be resuspended sediments. It could be dust that blows in. It could be coccolith off of coccolithophores. So anyway, we need to figure out how each of these different pieces scatter light, and then we can put together an IOP model that will tell us here's how this water body scatters light, depending on what's in the water. Okay, so first thing that is that um, all IOPs are additive. So the total absorption is equal to the absorption by water plus this phytoplankton plus that phytoplankton plus CDOM plus minerals plus whatever else is there. Same thing with the volume scattering function. The total volume scattering function is the sum of the volume scattering function for water plus phytoplankton plus minerals plus air bubbles, etc. So the, vi the, the IOPs are additive. Now, usually what we'll do is have one model for the scattering coefficient and we may have another models for the phase functions for the different parts and we want to add those pieces together. So if I write this as the VSF is equal to B times the phase function and I divide through by B, then I could say I have the phase function is the sum of the phase functions by the individual components but each component weighted by its scattering coefficient divided by the total scattering coefficient. So when you run hydrolyte and you say, I'll pick this phase function for phytoplankton and I'll pick this one for mineral particles, it takes those things and it figures out how much scattering you've picked for each of those components, weights the phase function, adds it up and gets the total phase function. Okay, so what kind of components make sense here? Well, we're gonna have the water part, pure water, and as Colin mentioned, seawater uh, scatters about 30% more strongly than fresh water. So when you run hydrolyte, you can pick whether you're in fresh water or seawater. And then you'll have phytoplankton, and you might have small phytoplankton and big phytoplankton, and those need to have different models for their scattering because the particle sizes affect the scattering very strongly. But in general, we'll have phytoplankton, we'll have CDOM, we'll probably assume that that's negligible scattering, we'll have mineral particles, and then, you know, whatever else happens to be there. Okay, so what, whoops, what does scattering by pure water look like? Well, to repeat what Colin said here, it's this function that looks like this, it's symmetric about 90 degrees. That's a characteristic of scattering by any particle that's much, much smaller than light. Not, it's not just water. But the phase, phase function actually has this 1 plus 0.835 cosine squared of the scattering angle kind of functional dependence. And it's often then written in terms of the scattering at 90 degrees, which depends on wavelength. So the shape does not depend on wavelength, but the magnitude does. And then the, uh, the value here at 90 degrees can be written in terms of wavelength and some other things. So this usually gets written as the water volume scattering function being the value at 90 degrees. There's a 
lambda to the minus roughly 4.3 and then the phase function shape here. So if we plot here the scattering coefficient of water, it's a lambda to the minus 4.32. Now, a lot of people call this Rayleigh scattering. Technically, Rayleigh scattering is wavelength to the minus 4, but the 4.32 is due to the fact that there are salt ions and so forth in the water that change the wavelength dependence a little bit. But basically, that's what it looks like. We get off easy with water. It's a nice, simple equation, and uh, life is good. Okay, and incidentally, of all the IOPs, this is the only one you can derive from theory with a pencil and paper, and Rayleigh did that. All the absorption coefficients for phytoplankton, all the volume scattering functions for mineral particles and all of that, you have to do the measurements. There's not any simple way you can sit down and theoretically say, this is what the absorption coefficient by these phytoplankton should look like. You just have to go measure it. And the reason is the phytoplankton are so complex in their structure. Well, how about non-algal particles? Uh, and this, or this is phytoplankton and non-algal particles together. So here's an old paper where we're looking at the scattering by particles divided by the average over the, the range he measured here, which was roughly 400 to 700. So this is just really looking at the shape of the scattering coefficient and you can see here in case one waters well there's some wavelength dependence here it's not terribly strong here's some case two waters and I don't know if we've actually defined case one and case two in here but case one waters are waters where their optical properties are determined primarily by phytoplankton and co-varying things like CDOM and detritus. So those things vary with the phytoplankton. They're, they're coming from phytoplankton. The CDOM is coming from phytoplankton that die and give off their little juices, and that's the CDOM. And so in case one waters, you can parameterize the IOPs and other things reasonably well, uh, reasonably meaning like a factor of three or five, uh, you can parameterize those values by the chlorophyll concentration because that's a good proxy for phytoplankton concentration. Case two waters are everything else. So uh, that could be coastal waters where there's extra CDOM from the land. It could be water where there's resuspended minerals. Those have nothing to do with phytoplankton. You could be in the middle of the Sargasso and you get a lot of dust blowing in from the Sahara that's case two water even though it's in the middle of the ocean. And so don't confuse case one and case two with meaning open ocean and coastal. It's really whether you can describe the water by chlorophyll or whether there are other things in there that do not co-vary with chlorophyll. So it's a very misused term and it's really not that useful anyway because you may have water that could be described as a case one water for absorption, but it would be case two for scattering because you had non-absorbing minerals in the water. So let's say calcite particles or quartz particles. So the absorption part might just depend on chlorophyll, but the scattering part would be phytoplankton plus some other non-absorbing particle. So it's widely used, but it's also kind of confusing. Well, anyway, in this paper by Baban, he also here has a plot now where he took various different data sets and plotted this normalized scattering versus wavelength to see what it looks like. Here's a wavelength to the minus one curve in red here. So you can see there's a little bit of wavelength dependence. It's not absolutely level. It's not independent of wavelength, but it's not as strong as one over wavelength either. So you just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah, some wavelength dependence, but not strong. Certainly nothing like water with its lambda to the minus four. Okay, uh, to develop some models for scattering by particles, uh, historically people often said, look, let's model scattering by particles as being the value at some reference wavelength, so maybe 550 nanometers, and then a lambda to the minus n dependence. 
and n is usually somewhere between 0 and 1, as we just saw. And large particles tend to have a small n, so they're almost independent of wavelength. Small particles have a larger n. If they have really small particles, water molecules, then n is minus 4.32. But for phytoplankton sized particles, n might be minus 0.5, minus 0.1, something in there. So, uh, and Colin showed you this uh, uh, particle size distribution plot where we went from small colloids up to pico and uh, nanoplankton and microplankton. And so here is a slope of n of, uh, or of minus 4 on the particle size distribution here. And you can play a lot of games with me theory to say, well, if I have a particle size distribution that has some slope here, can I predict the slope of the scattering? And the answer is yes, you can within the bounds of me theory, but then me theory is assuming you have homogeneous spherical particles. So that's often not a very good assumption. So to go on here, Emmanuel said, look, you know, and based on real world data, that rather than assuming that the scattering coefficient by particles is a lambda to the minus n or a power law, you actually get a better fit to the data if you use beam attenuation being a power law. So he has a nice paper where he shows that this is the way to go. Model beam attenuation with the power law and then you've got some measurement of absorption and you get B from this C minus the absorption. And if these are non-algal particles, those often have a kind of exponential absorption. Uh, I think uh, Colin showed you some of those plots the other day. So you've got this nice power law minus this more or less exponential curve, and you end up with a smoothly varying function of wavelength. If you have phytoplankton here, the beam C part is okay, but the absorption part, of course, has these, you know, shapes for whatever the phytoplankton absorption looks like. So your scattering coefficient, correspondingly, where the phytoplankton absorption goes up, the scattering part's going to go down. Uh, and so it's not as smoothly a varying a function. Okay, for scattering by mineral particles, for example, uh, here's some measurements. Uh, red earth, yellow clay, brown earth, calcareous sand. Well, you can see they're, you know, higher in the blue by factors of two or more, and they decrease towards the red, but there's all kinds of little bumps here. And so once again, you know, these are just four or five sets of measurements. You can go to somewhere else and find some other mineral particle that may be different from these. And the Bucata one was actually not measured, but it was deduced from optical measurements from reflectances. And I tend not to trust it too well, but these are actual measurements up here. And notice, of course, big problem. These guys measured from 400 out to 750, I think it was. And then people want to come along and run hydrolyte and put minerals into it. Well, if you're going to run hydrolyte from, say, 300 to 1,000 nanometers, you have to know the IOPs from 300 to 1,000 nanometers. Well, nobody's measured them. I mean, has anybody measured the uh, scattering by red clay at 300 nanometers? I don't know. I haven't seen the data. So when I take this kind of data and I put it into hydrolyte, I just kind of eyeball these curves here just to define some number that would go from 300 to 1,000. And then I can run hydrolyte from 300 to 1,000. But, you know, does this curve really come down like this, or does it go up like that, or does it level out? I have no idea. So it's just a warning that when I'm modeling something like scattering, and I'm extrapolating into the UV or the near-infrared, those extrapolations may be total garbage. And, you know, it's caveat, uh, user when you do this kind of stuff you run hydrolyte and for all i know this curve comes around like that but you know i don't have any data
So keep in mind that these models are very crude and very imperfect. Uh, here's some models for backscattering uh, by phytoplankton. This is a paper from Amanda Whitmire. So she went and a lot of, got a lot of different water samples from various areas. And she looked at the backscattering fraction here, B sub P, uh, sometimes a capital B, and sometimes people write it as a B with a little tilde. So here's the backscattering fraction, these different water bodies, not much wavelength dependence. Now, the scattering is depending on wavelength, and the backscattering is depending on wavelength, but the ratio is almost wavelength independent because both scattering and backscattering have pretty close to the same wavelength dependence. Here's a paper that I just got yesterday from Boss and, and uh, Wayne Slade. Uh, same sort of thing. They went out to a bunch of different places and they've plotted here the backscattering fraction of the particles. A little bit maybe of wavelength dependence. Now his red particles here, he says um, that red circles are recess resuspension dominated, so mineral particle dominated, and then down to the blue curves here, he says are less energetic, higher chlorophyll. So what you probably are seeing here is that the mineral particles are small and they're high index of refraction, so they have a high backscatter fraction, so it's roughly between two and a half and three percent. The phytoplankton are large particles and they have a low index of refraction, so they have a lower backscattering fraction, so sort of one and a half to two percent. In general, the higher the index of refraction, the stronger the scattering, and the smaller the particle, the higher the backscatter fraction. Large particles have less backscatter fraction, more strongly forward scattering. Okay, and so what we often do then to get a model for the backscattering coefficient is we'll take the scattering coefficient, we'll take the power law for the beam attenuation, we'll subtract off the absorption, which could have been measured, it could have been modeled, and then we'll assume that the backscatter fraction here is independent of wavelength. And so people do this kind of modeling a lot. So we have a model or data for the total particle scattering and then the backscatter fraction is independent of wavelength. When you run hydrolyte, you can actually give this a wavelength dependence by a power law if you want, but you know, probably don't really need to. Okay, now if you take these kinds of models, you'll find various models in the literature that model the backscatter fraction as a function of the chlorophyll. So it depends on whose paper you read, what data sets they had, and these predictions vary widely. Why? Because the models came from different areas, so they're different data sets, and they're trying to parameterize backscattering in terms of chlorophyll. Scattering does not correlate well with chlorophyll. Why not? Even in case one water, even with, with nice, clean, spherical, whatever, phytoplankton, Scattering doesn't chlor correlate very well with chlorophyll. Any reason for that? Absorption correlates pretty well with chlorophyll concentration, but not scattering. Any speculation on why? Think of the airplane with the, with the cloud behind it. Yeah, so you can have a certain amount of phytoplankton in the water, and you can have a lot of small phytoplankton or a few big ones. You'll have the same chlorophyll concentration, but the size of those phytoplankton can be much different, and size strongly affects the scattering. So that's why scattering doesn't correlate nearly so well with chlorophyll as does uh, absorption. So when you take their little curves here and you plug in the same chlorophyll, you find there's factors of two difference in what their best fit functions give you. And we'll finish up here uh, with uh, just one or, one or two more view graphs. Here's a whole bunch of data of backscatter fraction 
versus chlorophyll. It's all over the place. And then here are these three functions. Well, I submit to you that if you think, let's say, the red curve here is a best fit to this swarm of data, you have lower standards for getting a good fit to data than I have. To me, it looks like there's just no function that's going to describe this cloud of points here. And even though you'll find all of these functions in the literature as being models for the backscatter fraction. But it really is a mess. And what you're seeing here for a given chlorophyll is you're seeing different sizes and different shapes of particles that give you, you know, a factor of three or four difference in the backscatter coefficient. Keep in mind, remote sensing reflectance, as we'll see more next week, depends the first order on backscatter over absorption. So if you change the backscatter coefficient by a factor of three, you'll change the remote sensing reflectance by pretty much a factor of three. And then you're going to say, well, why did my measured remote sensing reflectance differ from the one that Hydrolyte predicted by a factor of two or three? Well, it's because you used this model and the reality was up here, or vice versa. Okay, so this is a good stopping spot. We have four minutes to get to lunch, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more, not too much more, about uh, things like models for phase functions. So that's it. When do we want to meet back here? How much time do you need?